So what I now want to do is move on to the, the implementation of all this, because this is all theory. What about practice? In Arup, we're great believers in using the biomimicry framework, because by, by mimicking natural organisms, which actually live efficiently, have learned to live efficiently on the planet, we can actually make this transition happen. And these principles in Janine Benyus's book, Biomimicry, we're now using to, to fashion eco-cities. And I think as a, as a frame for, for learning for students in IIHS, this is a wonderful frame in order to question existing practice to see whether it can be improved. So using those principles, the first one I want to briefly touch on is diversify and cooperate. Uh, diversity of culture and cultural roots of civilization are really important if we're going to make the transition work. And on the bottom here, there's a, there's a website that's, that's culturefuture.org. And this website is a result of uh, an event we held at the Copenhagen Climate Summit where we brought the art and culture community together uh, to actually find a role for the arts and culture in helping cities to make this transition work and to help the public to understand what's possible. And, and I haven't got time to talk about it, but I think it's, re it's a really important initiative. At the same time, we're adopting cultural planning techniques at the start of the engagement with communities, because in the end, everything has to start with communities. And so by engaging communities in the relationship between people and people, people and natural world, and people and the land in a place, you can then develop through bringing in uh, people from local philosophers, people uh, who are involved lo locally in the history, religion, anthropology of a place, very quickly you can get a, get a whole cultural um, uh, set of information to take the planning process forward. And I'm really hoping that on the, um, on the campus project we start with this. This is the first thing I hope we're going to do to demonstrate how powerful this is as a way of taking communities with us on the journey. We then have a whole issue about using energy efficiently, optimizing things. So now we have the whole issue of infrastructure. What sort of infrastructure do we need in our new cities in order to uh, enable us to get to this target? Clearly, uh, in the India's 11th five-year plan, you have uh, all sorts of targets for infrastructure investment. But I would say it's really, really important right now to make sure you question whether this is infrastructure for the ecological age or whether it's infrastructure for the industrial age because they're not the same thing. Building massive roads and not building high-speed railways, building centralized power stations rather than decentralized renewable energy systems is the difference. If you walk and cycle or you use a bus, this is the same number of people moving, you, you don't sterilize all that land and the economic value of this and the economic performance of the city doesn't get improved by cars if you look at the land value using that land efficiently. Imagine bringing food production into cities, uh, and imagine that all materials and products that are manufactured in India are reused and remanufactured uh, rather than using raw materials. This is a wonderful opportunity for Indian manufacturers to adopt this approach to have closed loop uh, systems for products. And for our buildings and our, 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 our infrastructure, the, the idea of designing for recycling, recondition, reusing and refurbishing and using local materials. You know all about integrated sustainable waste management, but just to make the point that having recycling cooperatives where households and communities work with the municipality and, and local industries to recycle and reuse materials is a very, very powerful economic advantage that you've already got in your Indian economy and you need to protect and develop uh, further. And finally, before I show the, the ending sequence, I just want to make the point about running on information, which most natural organisms did. And there are many, many examples of how the ecological age paradigm is being brought forward by information systems in India and Bangladesh and, and, and many other countries. And we, we must really look at how we can use those systems in cities because they're very cost effective. In terms of the way you implement this seemingly rather complex system, I'm a great believer in modeling, and here's the engineer in me coming out, really. Uh, you have to interconnect transport, water, food, energy, systems in cities, and, and do what we call integrated resource modeling to, to get the balance between land use density, GIS-based land use, and all of these systems to understand how to optimize it as a complete system. It sounds terribly complicated. Uh, it is terribly complicated, but I'll show you in a minute how I think in India you might be able to embrace this in an open source way. But you end up with these sorts of diagrams where you can actually optimize things. 
I'd been on the steering group of a, of a, a production of a model at Imperial College in London, which is able to take a land use GIS based plan to have agent activities of people, to have resource flows that arise out of people's choices, and to, to have the, the service grids that are necessary to support those activities, and to optimize that on an interactive basis and set it up for any city or region as a research tool. Now, I've managed to persuade them uh, to take this model and make it available as an open source model for countries around the world. And I would be able to bring this model to put it into IAHS. And IAHS could then place it in universities all around India as a way of doing research locally into what is possible. So here we're talking about the art of the possible in terms of efficiency and moving forward. So all the different agencies would be able to get an idea of what's possible if they started communicating together, which they're not doing at the moment. So this is an idea, but I'd really like to <coughs> see if we can take it forward. <coughs> and students would then be able to work with this in IHS and, and, and go out into, the, into India with a knowledge of this type of model, which could then be tied up with the university. Finally, I just want to make the point that I've just been appointed chair of something called the Institute for Sustainability uh, in London, which is aiming to be a, an institute that takes deep research and translates it into demonstration projects in the UK. We have a sister institute in Dongtang in China, uh, and we're in discussions with having one in Africa, but we'd very much like, maybe now, because we're not getting anywhere with McCrary, to move that to South Africa. Uh, I think I, the model of IHS is perfect for, for this model. And of course, we have someone else in the room who might be interested in doing something in Sao Paulo. So it might be possible to, to bring IHS thinking into this network where we can attract the, the interest of the private sector into this space between research and implementation. I feel very honored to be here, but I feel very excited for you because I really genuinely believe that this vision of tunneling through to this place is possible if India really moved fairly quickly. And if you do that, you will not only develop your own economy in, in a very powerful way, in a way that will really surprise you, but also you'll, you'll find yourself in a world leading position in manufacturing goods and other things in a way that China is not able to do because China has spent really quite a lot of time going down the wrong route and is having to go backwards. You haven't done that yet. So I think the opportunity is there for you. You've got a lot of skills and, and, and opportunity. But I think the IIHS will provide a very key set of people in your society to enable you to embrace this new paradigm. Thank you very much.